Okay, so the video is recording as well. I also want to apologize for the previous version, um, or the previous video I uploaded. The scaling was weird. I think I have it fixed in this one now. So we're going to get Maya open. It's opening, it's just on the other screen. There we go. There we go. Um, so, I'm going to, um, I'm going to create a couple of primitives. Uh, I'm going to make mine kind of like, um, one of those like driving obstacle courses you see like you know on tv they're like swerving through the cones or whatever i'm gonna be thinking of it like that i'm not gonna be, do too much modeling or anything like that i'm just gonna make a maybe a uh, um a cone i don't even know which direction it's pointing and i'll put a couple of boxes in there for it to kind of navigate around right so let's go ahead and i'm gonna create a little cone here and scale it so i kind of get information about it so I know which direction it's pointing um, quick little shortcut um, you can start rotating and sometimes you want it to be perfect like get it to a perfect 90 degree angle um, we can type negative 90 here or 90 um, to get it to that perfect 90 degree angle sorry I gotta turn my number lock um, or if while we're rotating if we hold down J it will snap to increments. So that's a handy little tool to remember. So I got me a, a cone here. I'm going to move it back here out of the way. And I'm going to put just a, a handful of boxes in here. I'm going to create one. And then I'm just going to hit Control D to get the same box over and over again. Maybe something like this. And just to make it a little more challenging, I'm also going to create a little torus, a little donut here. Um, under the inputs, I can change the thickness of this, the uh, the radius of the torus. Make it a little bigger. Make the section radius a little smaller. And so now I can make a little ring for my arrow to go through. I'm going to put mine a little higher there. So again, you can make yours however you want. Um, but this is this is kind of what I'm what I'm going with right now. Okay. Um, actually, let me let me go and put that back down on the ground. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make my arrow sort of swerve in and out in between these and go through the through the loop, right? Um, and I'm going to do that on my timeline here um, by setting keyframes. So what, what was the shortcut for a keyframe again? S. S, right? And what does S do? What, is, what are we doing when we hit S? It sets the frame as a keyframe. It sets the frame as a keyframe. But let's talk about what a keyframe is. Like, what, is, what does that mean? It's like, at a certain point in time, you want the object to be here doing this. So yeah, at a certain point in time, like we would say on our timeline, on frame one, I'm, I'm very happy with my... Right, my little cone starting here at the beginning, right? This is where I want it to be on frame one every time I go to frame one, right? And so the way I think of a keyframe is a marker in time on these values, on my, my um, translate X, Y, and Z, right? So if I go in here and select this cone, right, sort of pull it back here and hit S, what I'm doing is I'm telling Maya that every time I'm on frame one, I want my translate X to be zero, and I want my translate Y to be zero, and I want my translate Z to be negative 52.152, and so on and so forth, right? Um, so what if I'm not on frame one? What if, I, what if I dragged it out to frame 80 right now? You haven't changed anything, so 
I haven't changed anything. So Maya recognizes that that's the last keyframe I've set in this timeline, right? And so since that's the last keyframe I've set, it's not going to change anything by itself further out here, right? Um, now, if I move my timeline, actually, I'm going to do this from the top view so it's a little clearer to see. So, um, again, I've shown you this before. If you tap the space bar, it'll show you all four views. And you can go to your top view here, like this, right? Um, or you can do it from your side view, either one. Um, let's do it from the side. That way we can go sort of across it. Right? So we can see this from the side view, right? Um, and I'm going to have it zoom in and out like this and then go through the, the cylinder. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is you don't always have to just tap your space bar. You can also go to um, panels and you can choose your different cameras from panels. You can go to orthographic, choose your front view or choose your side view. Um, or if you hold down your space bar and get this marking menu, if you click on the word Maya, you can also get different views from there. Right? So again, I'm, I'm pretty happy in this view, so this is, this is where I'm going to animate from. Okay. So I know that at the end of my animation, um, I want this arrow to be on the other side here, and right? I want it to be out through this, through this cone. So let's just go out to frame, let's say 80. Right? And I'm going to go ahead and move my arrow all the way to that cone. Now, a couple of things you'll notice. Red tick mark here, frame 80. I'm on frame 80. My cone is there, right? but I haven't hit S. Right? So if I move my timeline, what's going to happen? It's going to go back to the way you set frame 1. Right. So just because I moved it didn't mean that um, I, I changed anything. I just changed its location. But if I, if I go scrubbing on my timeline, it's going to snap back there, right? Because that keyframe is an instruction that says, on frame one and thereafter, be on that location. Have those values set, right? I temporarily moved them around, but I didn't nail that down. I didn't say, S, stay there, right? S for stay. Um, actually, S is for set. So, so if I move it all the way out here, frame 80, I hit S, right? Now what I've done is the same thing I've done here, just with different values on a different point in the timeline, right? I've said on frame 80, I want my translate X and Y to still be 0, but now I want my translate Z to be 49.801, right? And so as we saw before on this first frame, the only thing that was different was the translate Z was negative 52, 152, right? Um, so that means that all Maya has to do to figure out how this arrow, whatever, gets from that end to the other end is just to um, sort of transition between those two numbers, right? In fact, like, you can see um, 52 here, go to 80, 49 there. So if I go halfway in between there, or negative 52 to 49, if I go halfway in between, I'm going to assume I'm going to be getting close to zero. So let's just, let's just try that out. There we go. So we're at seven there. That, that value is at seven, right? And you'll see that that's, that's appropriate. Like, like that's the appropriate location. It's, you know, so it looks like about frame 41, Maya is um, set at negative zero point. 208, right? Now, I want to point out we're traveling from a negative number to a positive number because we're crossing this origin point, right? We're crossing this center line where that value goes from negative to positive, right? Um, so Maya is just calculating that transition between two values, right? And you have done this before in, in other classes, right? Let's say I... Um, Let's say we were tracking um, a, a child's height, right? And we said, well, when, when the kid was five years old, he was approximately three feet tall, right? Um, and when he was 20 years old, he was approximately five feet tall, right? So, so we could, like, take a stab in the dark and say, well, what about when he was 12 years old? How tall was he, right? 
And we may not be right, but we know it's somewhere between those two heights, right? If I measured um, a kid's height every day for like his life between the ages of 5 and 20, right, we could make a little point on a graph and we could chart how that, um, how that growth happens, right? Um, and, and we could graph that out. Well, that's all Maya is doing here, too. Maya is generating a graph of this motion, right? So we're not going to dive too deeply into this in this exercise, but I want to show you that it exists, right? I'm going to go to Windows, Animation Editor, Graph Editor. Right, popped it open on the other screen. But you'll see that the Graph Editor is... A graph of, I currently have the, uh, the arrow selected, it's a graph of every one of those channels that are in our channel box. So translate x, y, rotate x, y, z, scale x, y, z, right? Um, and right now that graph doesn't look that interesting. The only thing we really see changing on it, like if I click translate x here, you'll see translate x doesn't change. Um, if I click translate Y, it doesn't change. Actually, very few of these change. The only one that changes is translate Z, right? So the way we would read this graph is the same way we would read um, most graphs. Usually, horizontal is time, right? If you, again, if you're charting out this, this child's height, um, more than likely, you're going to be going in that direction for time. This is because we're kind of used to thinking of time that way, right? You scrub. Um, from uh, from left to right on your YouTube timeline too, right? Um, correct. So so this is frame one, and as we move forward in time here, we get up to frame eighty. And in fact, you can see that across the top of the graph. You see these these numbers up here, right? So, if time is side to side, what is up and down? Position. Position? Kind of, like, let's be a little bit more precise. Um, so, so our position like, is really just, a, like a position in the world is really just a combination of those three axes, right? <clears throat> the translate x, translate y, translate z. So as we go up and down, what we're actually changing is the value that is in the channel box, right? So what this blue curve represents um, is that value change of translate z, right? And you'll see that at the beginning here, we're roughly at 58, right? That's where that little keyframe is there. And at the end here, we're roughly at, whatever, 40, no, I guess it's closer to 50. Um, 49, I think is what it was. And so what we get is those two numbers changing over time, right? And so Maya has to solve the location. We've given it one in 80. It has to solve the other 78 locations of this arrow in between those frames, right? Um, <clears throat> so this is... This thing is um, actually really powerful, right? Um, because if I wanted my arrow to, uh, that motion to change, right? Um, like, let's say I didn't want that to be, to end at the end of that circle. I can grab these keyframes in here, and I can shift those up and down, right? And if I lower that, now you'll see that at the end of my animation, the arrow just makes it to there, right? Um... I can make drastic changes to my animation very quickly inside of the graph editor. The problem with the graph editor is that it takes a little bit of time to, um, to switch your mind back and forth between making pretty things dance and thinking about numbers and values in a graph, right? It's like if I were to stop you halfway through doing a painting and say, hey, quick, um, like, figure out the, you know, this fraction divided by this fraction. And you're like, wait, my brain isn't there right now, right? My, my brain is elsewhere making pretty things. Um, and we have, to, we have to kind of work at that as, as a, um, an animator. Like, that's one of the challenging things that you'll face 
this semester and in animation fundamentals is getting used to using the graph editor as a tool to make art. I know that's, that seems weird, but it is. Like we're gonna use a graph to make art. Um, because this thing can become very, very powerful in that um, you know, I can adjust how this, um, how this object takes off, right? So right now if I hit play, it's gonna play it probably too fast because I have to set it to play it real time. So playback speed, real time. But you'll see how this motion works is um, our arrow, our arrow starts here, right? And then kind of slowly starts moving, speeds up through the middle, and then slows down at the end, right? You see how that progression, like it sort of, it sort of slowly starts at the beginning and, and slows down at the end, right? Um, well, uh, I can change that, right? If I wanted it to look like this thing exploded from the beginning, right, then I can change the way this transition happens here, the way this curves transition happens, right? And I can do um, this, and now my animation, watch how it starts. Like it just sort of like rockets out of the beginning, right? So this is, this is when I said, you know, in traditional animation, the keyframe animator drew frame one and five and then gave that timing chart to the in-betweener so they would know how to make that transition. This is your version of that, right? This is you being in control of how Maya makes that transition because Maya is always going to choose the simplest same option for every transition, right? It's gonna choose this like subtle ease in and out at both ends, right? Um, and sometimes that's not what you want. Actually, most of the time that's like Maya's default answer is not the correct answer or not the answer you're wanting, right? So this is how we're in complete control of this. I, I want you to know that this is there. I encourage you to play with this. We're not actually going to have to do a ton in this for this first exercise. But know that this is a quick way of making changes to your animation and making your animation look better. Um, like, don't worry too much about what I'm doing right now, but there's the option to edit this inside of, let's see, key, add key tool, inside of Maya here where I can just go in and start drawing new keys. Uh, that's not, this mouse sucks. And I can very quickly make some very big changes to this animation to where now just by altering that curve <coughs> and we can we can do some very quick changes to it now um, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of those and we're actually not going to work a ton in here today in the graph editor. we're going to work at setting keyframes and altering keyframes okay? so I'm just gonna go ahead and close the graph editor I show you this so you know it exists and to encourage you to play with it, to encourage you to, to get in there and manipulate things in there and just see what results you get, right? Um, the cool thing about this is save your file before you do that and then just go play. Like, just go start wiggling stuff. See what happens when you, like, shift things, when you twist things. Like, does it make it better? Like, you can't break it because you already saved it, right? And let's say you, like, do something crazy to it and you're like, that looks absolutely terrible. Well, then don't save it. Just go back and open that first one you, you did, right? And that's, that's the beauty of this, is that you can just, you can just tinker and start seeing results. Um, so, we have this motion, arrow plunging through these boxes and then through this loop. Um, and that's not what we want, right? We, wanna, we want this animation to to sort of zigzag, right? So I'm going to go in here and start breaking this down more, right? So I can sort of plan out my animation, right? I can say, I think it's gonna go over this one first, dip through here, go up here, dip through here, right? So that's sort of my idea of, of the path I want that to go, right? 
The cool thing about Maya is it already has some of that information for you, right? Like if I know I want it to be above this box when it gets to here, well, I can just sort of go in between here and sort of subdivide that, right? Like I'm halfway through. It's already got me to this, like, this point where I need it to be near this box, right? Except I don't want it to be inside of it. I want it to be above it, right? So I can just move that up and hit S. And so now, at least for that part, like this is kind of bypassing the, uh, um, the entire um, um, obstacle course, right? But at least now that is in the right spot on frame 42. Um, again, the graph editor, this time, I, I will show you this again briefly. Um, I didn't change anything to my translate Z. It's still in the same point, just got an extra keyframe in there. Um, now it's my translate Y that changed. So this motion is actually a combination of that translate Z changing and that translate Y changing, right? Um, and so eventually all of this motion, like I'm going to have the object turning and curving and rotating, you can even have it scaling. All of those things are just going to be a combination of my translates, rotates, and scales changing over time, right? That combination is going to give me a fluid motion. So think about that like how you rotate your arm, right? You don't just rotate your arm in one axis at a time and be like, oh, i got to grab my bottle. I better rotate my arm out and then rotate it forward and then twist it and then try to lower it down again and then i got to bend my elbow, right? Like everything kind of moves together, right? And all of those axes kind of combine to get a swooping motion, right? And that's, that's one of the reasons this graph editor is nice is because it allows us to manipulate that. So... Um, one of the issues with, with keyframing is that sometimes I, I work really hard to create or to, to get my object in the exact location um, because like later you'll be animating characters, you'll be animating much more complex um, objects, right, or series of objects. Like a character rig isn't just going to be one arrow, it's going to be literally hundreds of controls, right? And you'll spend like upwards of an hour getting a character into one pose, like one perfect pose, right? And you're like, that's perfect. Now I'm going to scrub my timeline and see what happens. Oops, I forgot to hit S. I lost that whole pose, right? And that is a pain in the butt. And they recognized that when they were designing the software. So they gave you a tool that, that, that helps that, right? So like, like I'm saying, like, I know that it's going to be underneath this box. Right, so I may like spend forever getting this in the exact right location, and then when I scrub, oh, I lost that keyframe, right? So this button down here in the bottom corner, you may not be able to see it very well, but I'll point it out. It's underneath your, your play buttons and your all this stuff here. Um, there's a whole set of buttons there. There's one with a, a guy like running next to a cog. It's the one right next to it. Kind of looks like a recycle button or a recycle logo or something. It's like circular arrows with a little like a little line in the middle. If we click that button, that button is the auto key button. Okay? So that means if I make a change to one of these axes, or to any of this, any of these values, any of these channels, translate X, Y, Z, if I make a change to them, it's going to set a keyframe on the channel that I made a change to. Right? So let's before I do that, let me let me just kind of show you. When I don't have a keyframe on my timeline, the color of that channel is kind of this light pink color. When I am on a keyframe, the color is red, right? So pink means that it's animated. It, there's just not a keyframe where you're currently at, right? Um, now, if I move in my translate Y on this axis, watch what happens in my channel box. I want to get it down to here. And you'll see now my translate Y has a keyframe on it, right? None of my other channels do. So that is something that is both good and bad, right? Um, depending on how you use it. It's, it's one of those Spider-Man situations, right? It's, it's a lot of power. You can move stuff around, get keyframes everywhere. But that leaves you that responsibility of recognizing that those other channels are not nailed down there. Right. Um, let me show you why that is why that's important. Right. So, um, if I just set that keyframe right there, right, 
And I'm like, look, it, it, it goes perfectly underneath the box and then comes up right there, right? Um, but let's say I decided I wanted to change my object start point on frame one. Let's say I move it way back here, right? Well, now that arrow is not going to be there, right? Because I just train, changed the way my translate Z transitioned in between those two keyframes, right? And so now I'm, I'm kind of going through that corner of that box. See that? Um, make this a little bit clearer. I'll scoot it back even more. And so now it's like I'm blowing through that box, right? So that I, I want to be in control of this. So I'm going to undo all that stuff. And so even though AutoKey is updating those channels, my personal workflow is to still set a keyframe on everything, at least in this early part of the process. Um, so if I go ahead and hit S, you'll see that now everything is nailed down on frame 30. And what this is doing is this is, this is letting me be in control. I'm saying Maya can't mess up frame 30. I just nailed it down, right? I, I, it's not moving from there unless I tell it to, right? Um, so now we get that, right? So I'm going to use auto key to go through and key the rest of this now. So I said I wanted to go over this first box. So I get to about there, go up above it, hit S. And I wanted to go under this box. And then I want it to sort of settle to a stop there. So if I hit play, So, it's looking, it's looking closer, right? At least now it's going in between the boxes. Um, but I made this thing an in arrow intentionally, right? Um, because let's say you're, let's say you're walking, um, let's say you're walking somewhere that's very windy, right? You don't walk there like straight forward and then step to the side and then walk and then like step to the side, right? We, we kind of rotate an angle in and out of those things. So I'm going to put some more keyframes in here just to make this thing do what I want it to do, right? So let's say right here in the middle, this is an arrow. This is an area where this looks really awkward, right? Um, and it's because it's traveling sideways, um, but not like pointing in that direction. Right? So I go in here about to frame 25. I'm just going to manipulate this, position it, and hit S. So now you'll see, and I can kind of do it here as well. So position this um, and hit S. So you can see that first little section is looking better now, right? So I'm just going to continue to set keyframes until I get um, the motion I'm happy with. Closer, I want to kind of fix right here. I want it to pull it up a little bit more, straighten it out. Now, sometimes I forget to hit S, so just to be safe, I'm going to sort of step through these and, and make sure that I have a keyframe on all of them. I'm going to show you another shortcut key really quick. This is a, a really handy one. Um, the greater than, less than keys, they're right next to your M button. Um, if I hit those, it'll allow me to step through my keyframes. Right. So it's just going to the keyframes. Right. And this allows me to look at those and see if that's what I want it to be. Um, what it also allows me to do is recognize that on frame 46, I forgot to hit S. You see that? Like I have all those other channels not keyed. So this is, this is like Greg Marlowe workflow. I'm sure you'll hear weird noises coming from my keyboard all the time. Um, I can step through and hit S really quick. So, Okay, now I'm pretty sure everything has a keyframe on it. Right? Um, 
So I, I do that sometimes. Let's see how this is looking now. So a little better, right? Um, it's got some hitchiness to it. Like there's some weird hitch that happens here, right? Um, and there's a little bit of a weird hitch that happens there. Um, and more than likely, some of that is um, either a speed thing, like it speeds up there and makes a change a little quicker than I expected, or a little quicker than the rest of the animation seems like it should, or it's something in the graph ender that's like sort of a, a wonky curve, like it's kind of twisted weird or something, and I just need to, to clean that up. Um, but speed is a big, um, a big part of animation, right? So we're talking about timing here. If we start on frame one, right, we're ending on frame 80, right? That's a, a finite amount of time it takes this animation to happen, right? Uh, 24 frames per second, we're, we're looking at just under like, um, probably about three and a half seconds, something like that. Um, that's my quick, poor math in my head. Um, option. And sometimes I want that to happen longer or I want it to happen faster, right? If we want this to look like it's like, zoom, like zooming through, how do I make this faster? You put the frames closer together. Put the frames closer together. How do I make it, the opposite the question, how do I make that longer? Farther apart, right? So the distance between these keyframes means it takes more frames for that action to happen. And that means that I can adjust my timing of this animation, okay? So right now, I'm going to make them, um, sort of move them around a little bit and make them a little further apart, right? So um, I can go in here, and one of the ways I can do that, um, if I hold down Shift and click, I can drag and highlight sections of my timeline. Once I've done that, you'll see I have some arrows here in the middle and I have some arrows on the end. These arrows in the middle allow me to shift that entire range around. Right? And you'll notice that they kind of snap when I do that. You see how it does that? And that's because um, it's snapping to the whole number keyframe, right? Um, I just shifted from frame that key from frame 31 to frame or from fr frame 32 to frame 33, right? But on that graph, Maya is also um, calculating the motion that happens in between those keyframes, right? So I can have a frame 31 and a half, right? The only problem with that is when I scrub my timeline, I'm only seeing whole keyframes. Now I bring that to your attention because. I can also scale this entire frame range, right? Again, if I highlight everything, if I use these arrows on the end, it's going to stretch it, right? And I can scale it out. Now, it's going to scale it out mathematically correct, right? And not all numbers divide evenly. So that means that some of these keyframes are going to be left on partial frames, right? It's going to end up on, like, 29.2 or... Um, you know, 45.7, right? And that's not very useful for us because if I go back and make changes to what I think is frame 45, I'm actually editing at frame 45, not 45.7, and I can mess up my animation. So once I've scaled this, I have to remember to right click and hit snap. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna snap all of those keyframes to whole numbers, right? And so now, my animation's a little slower, right? Okay. Now, I show you all of this um, because this is very similar to what we're going to be doing um, in the project here a little bit. So setting keyframes, shifting keyframes, um, and just making things move, right? That's, that's what we're going for. Um, I will show you that, like, this is the point where I would usually go into the graph editor, animation editor, graph editor, and see if anything looks incorrect, right? Like some of those hard motions we're seeing may be coming from the fact that um, this translates a little too quickly down to this point, right? Um, maybe I can just shift some stuff around. Remove that keyframe, right? 
uh, my translate excuse me, my translate Z is my forward and backward. And you see that some of these sort of lunge forward or, or, or not. Um, I, could, I could go in here and try to even those up a little bit. I, think I could sort of say maybe that one can be a little lower. All right. does, that mess, does that mess my animation up? No. So there it kind of juts down quickly. That almost needs another keyframe. Because some of this is also in our rotation, right? Is our rotation X? Yeah. Right. Um, now, I'll also point out that all of these have tangents, which means I can adjust those tangents and change how it eases in and out. Uh, and all of this is just being in control of um, how, my animation, how my animation works. So I would encourage you to play in here. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about the graph editor over the next, um, the next few months and you'll get a little bit more comfortable in it. And hopefully by the end of the next animation class, you won't even be thinking about it. You'll just, it's like, it'll just be like uh, a gut reaction to open the graph editor and make changes, right? Um, so, questions, comments? I'm gonna do this. Okay. I, 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 this is actually a relatively new exercise. We only started doing this um, last semester. But I'm going to go ahead and save this and show you what we're going to be doing. I'll show you with um, another student's work. And then I will, um, I believe I have, let me pull this up. Um, so... So this is what you're going to be doing, okay? I'm going to give you a, a maze and an arrow, right? And you're going to animate that arrow navigating around that maze without hitting a wall, right? Without, without like, just basically stabbing through all of the walls, right? Um, so I want, I want you to take that as a challenge. I mean, unless you have a reason for it to, like, bump into a wall and bounce off or whatever, like try to make it not accidentally blow through a wall, right? Like just try to see if you can guide it all the way through. And then just have fun with this. Like this is like, this is an, um, an autonomous arrow that has apparently managed to um, uh, navigate itself. Yeah. I will, sure, we'll put that in there real quick. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, let, yeah, let's go ahead and show you that. Sometimes Arnold does, you don't have this little Arnold thing up here. Um, Arnold is a plugin. So if we go to Windows, it just means that the plugin crashed. So settings and preferences, plugin manager. <laughs> so again, that was under Windows, settings and preferences, plugin manager. And then in this plugin manager, it's going to be close to the bottom. We're looking for something called M2A right there. So it's Maya to Arnold. Right? And you just need to make sure that that's checked until you load it. So, Okay, let's look at a couple more of these just so you get some ideas. So I'll give you the arrow. I'll give you the, uh, I'll give you the um, maze. Um, and for the most part, this is a... Um, Again, like a, a, a <laughs> this person got a little creative with it. Um, I forgot about that. That's funny. Uh, let's find. <laughs> so, um, so this is yours. I, again, I know that this is. 
this is one that I, I just went from two extremes to the other. I went from like, be creative and make whatever like Pokemon fan art you want to make, right? Like, like whatever it is you want to do, run wild. Think of this as more like doing jumping jacks, right? Like this is, this is practicing setting these keyframes. Um, so when you get into a 3D project, you can make it move however you want to, right? So feel free to be creative with it, like have it, do some interesting stuff. But try to convince us that this arrow is really like moving in a in a natural way. Like, is it is it a very robotic arrow? Is it like can you convince me that this arrow is sleepy when it's going through this uh, through this obstacle course? Um, can you convince me that it's nervous? Right? I, I saw one um, uh, the other day uh, for people going into the midpoint review, and she just nailed it and making me feel like this arrow was like navigating this maze for its life, right? Like, it was like, if I don't get out of this maze, I'm going to get crushed by a giant boulder like Indiana Jones and, like, whatever. Like, so have fun with this, but have fun with the animation part of it. Right? Like, I know the, the first instinct is going to be like, oh, I could remodel all of this and remodel that arrow to be a fish, and then what's going to happen is, you know, a week down the road, you're going to be like, crap, I'm out of time, what happened? Um... So actually, let me find uh, the actual assignment, because I honestly don't remember the due date on this. Okay, so um, we're looking at Monday, okay, so this will be due on Monday. Um, it should be set up to render um, pretty much like this. Um, it shouldn't probably take too long to render it, um, but you don't actually have to render this. You can also play blast it if you want. So let me go ahead and get the file up on the network for you and show you where that's at. So give me one second. Okay, so under Greg, POA, files, I'm going to paste it in there. So there's your entire project, maze, um, file, new scene, don't save. Um, I'm going to go ahead and copy that to my desktop so I can show it to you. So again, as a refresher, oh, does that work? So as a refresher, I never just double click on a Maya file. Please don't do that. I'm going to get file, open scene. I'm going to set my project. And I'm going to set my project to that maze project. So it's right there on my desktop. Set it. And then it's under scenes. I can open up maze. Okay. You should always be doing that. And all of your files that have anything to do with this project always need to be underneath that maze folder. If they're anywhere else, things will start to break in bad ways. So, so yeah, you just have to play blast this, um, but we can move this around um, however you want to edit it. Um, I already have this set up in the top view, so that's where I would recommend you animate it from, because then you really only have to worry about three channels, right? Your translate, I guess it's your probably your translate X and Z are going to be your motion, and then your rotate, let's just, let's look and see. It looks like, yeah, translate X, Z, and rotate Y are going to be the only real channels you have to animate then, right? Um, all of those others exist, but, you know, you, if we're from this angle, those are the only ones you're really going to see, so. So, yes. Any questions on this? Comments on this? Um, feel free to make, like, I'm not going to give you, like, a time limit on this. 
Um, but you should consider that um, the timing on um, the animation will control the length, right? If you want your arrow to feel nervous, maybe it'll take a little longer. I expect most of these to probably come in under the 10 second range. Um, but if it's a little longer, whatever, that's cool. So, yes? So, is there a file or something for it? No, it was up in that maze folder I just put up there. So um, up under POA, files, maze, and then you just download that and, uh, and use that. So, other questions? OK, so I'm, I'm going to ask a question of you now. No? no? The answer's no? How many, how many of you like this part of it? How many of you like the making okay. things move part? That's a yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you already said no, dude. You just get one answer. No. Uh, um, so this is this is the part that I want to emphasize. Like we have to use we don't have to, but we we, we are using Maya because Maya is the most um, prolific software for this. Like it's the, the software that is um, most ubiquitous in the industry. Um, and some of this class is just getting over the hurdle of using Maya. Right? But where you go after this class, if you go into the animation concentration, it's a lot of this. Right? It's a lot of controlling the motion of stuff. It's not writing stories. It's not um, designing characters. It's not modeling buildings. It's animating. It's making things become animate. Right? It's turning them from a dead, lifeless bunch of pixels into something that the world believes, believes is alive. So, that's the part I want you to see if you like. Like while you're doing this, like some of you are going to be like, "This is so much fun! I get to twist it," and some of you are like, ah, "I don't like this part. I want to get back to modeling." Right? That's what these classes are for. So you can start to have those experiences, and those experiences can inform the decisions you make from here on out in your college career. Right? Yes. What is your question? Uh, it's an on the screen question. Oh, yeah. Okay. So if there's no more questions, I'm going to go ahead and stop the video, stop the screencast, and you have a little bit of time, I think, to be working if you would like, um, but the class is yours. Um, if you decide I've had enough learning and I want to go drink milkshakes, I get that. Um, and again, it's, it's open lab time at this point. You're free to come and go as you please. You're free to hang out and ask questions. You're free to work. You're free to watch those YouTube video uh, playlists you've been um, favoriting, uh, so uh, yes. still a question on that? Did you have a class question or is it on the screen question? Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the video and um, then we'll just hang out for the rest of the class.